Good afternoon. Uh, today I'll discuss the research in my group uh, focused on nanoelectronics and optical electronics based on 2D materials. Here I will highlight a few results uh, we got in the past few years on this topic. For graphene, it has very high mobility, uh, but have zero band gap. So we use graphene to build RF device, both on rigid substrate and flexible substrate. We were able to demonstrate 350 gigahertz cutoff frequency for graphene on silicon carbide. That's a world record at that time um, for graphene transistors. We also successfully demonstrated graphene RF device on flexible substrate on polyimide. So this is will be one step on flexible electronics using 2D materials. For uh, logic transistors, graphene is not suitable because it has zero band gap. In that case, transition metal dicoctinide like molybdenum disulfide will be a better choice, which have finite a sizable band gap and reasonable mobility. So we built a graphene MOS2 transistors aggressively scale down the channel lengths. We found that the DIBO drain induced barrier lowing didn't show an upturn until we shrink down the channel lengths up to 32 nanometer. So this is used a very thick gate dielectric. It's a 60 nanometer half oxide for short channels. If we extrapolate, if we scale down the gate oxide as well to three nanometer, we can predict that the channel lengths can scale down below seven nanometers. This means 2D materials can be used for aggressively scaled uh, logic devices. So that's one poten uh, potential application for t 2D materials. The third uh, uh, category of device we uh, made is plasmonic device. Since graphene has very high mobility, it's similar to metals. We can actually pattern graphene into nano ribbons, nano discs, and make them into arrays to behave like a plasmonic device. So here we use graphene nano ribbon arrays build the photo detectors. So the red line is a photo current with plasmonic feature in it, and the blue line is the blue line is without plasmonic feature. That means the light polarization is perpendicular to the ribbon, and the blue line is parallel to the ribbon. So we can see the photo current is much higher if we have localized plasmons. This localized plasmon is come from the lateral confinement of the nano <coughs> ribbons. We can see that the enhancement of the photo current can be uh, much higher. It's higher than ten. This plasma resonance frequency can also be tuned uh, by gate bias. That will change the current density in graphene. This means the plasmonic device built by graphene can be tuned dynamically during operation, even after the device is made. The graphene uh, plasmonics can also use for biosensing. So if we use the graphene pattern into nano ribbons and spin PMMA or other molecules a one mo atomic layer on top, for example, one monolayer of boron nitride, then we can measure the attenuation of the infrared light. We found that if we have this nano ribbon feature uh, on top of underneath the material, we can enhance the signal by about five times. So this can use for biosensing. The, the number six uh, type of device that we're investigating is uh, the tunneling transistors. This use 2D material, stack them together, form a hydrostructure, and form top gate, bottom gate, and soft stream features. So this transistor will be different from traditional transistor. Traditional transistor is based on the source and the drain. From source and drain, the diffusive uh, uh, transport. For tunneling device, however, it's based on band-to-band -band tunneling. So from source and drain, is band band tunneling will be controlled by the energy band between source and channel. When these are not perfectly aligned, the tunneling path will be cut off. So you have a perfect zero uh, current in that case. Then we can make a much steeper uh, transition from on and off. So this steep surface hole swing will mean that you can use lower supply voltage. So traditional CMOS the supply voltage is limited by how much uh, voltage you need apply to switch from on to off. If you want the on-off ratio of 10 to the fourth, 
then you need at least four decades uh, of current transition. That means you have very finite uh, voltage you need to apply. The minimum subcycle swing for traditional CMOS is 60 millivolts per decade. That means you need at least 0.24 volt. If you use tunneling fat, however, this limitation will be removed. Your potential theoretically, you can go to zero, this transition. So that means maybe 0.1 volt is enough for your supply voltage. So we simulate the t fat based on black phosphorus. We found that the switching energy versus switching delay each have a much better characteristic as compared to traditional high performance or low, pulse, low, low power CMOS. So this means TFAT will be, have a, a promising application for low power logic. The last uh, category, uh, type of device we're investigating is uh, ferroelectric memories. Ferroelectric memory typically use, either use a ferroelectric capacitor or use a ferroelectric transistor. That means if you apply electrical field across the ferroelectric uh, materials, the dipole will switch the direction. Even after you remove the electrical field, the dipole will remain in that direction. So you have a memory effect. This uh, ferroelectric uh, memory, random access memory, uh, will have advantage of uh, low power as compared to SRAM, DRAM, or MRAM, that stands for magnetic uh, random access memory, and PRAM, that's phase change memory. FRAM also will have, it has similar power consumption as RAM, that's resistive memory. However, you have a much better endurance as compared to RAM. So ferroelectric memory is a very promising nine volatile memory. Traditionally, the ferroelectric memory is built uh, by complex peroxide like a PZT or SVT. However, those material have problem is Number one, it's not compatible with CMOS. So it's very difficult to introduce this uh, material into a CMOS line. Number two is it's hard to scale. It's uh, usually uh, deposited by spin-on process. Um, so it have a thickness limitation. Below that, you won't get ferry electricity. Recently, a new ferry electric material was discovered. It's hafnium-based ferry electric material. So if you dope aluminum, zirconium, or lanthanum in hafnium oxide, then this high-k dielectric could be ferroelectric. So this new ferroelectric uh, material has many advantages. Number one is it has good scal uh, scalability. You can scale down uh, below five nanometer. You still get a very strong ferroelectricity. Recently, I think people even demonstrate 2.5 nanometer zirconium doped hafnium oxide so it's decent for electricity. Uh, number two is it's fully compatible with CMOS. Right now uh, for Intel, IBM, uh, TI, TMMC, already using hafnium oxide as gate dielectric. So there is no problem to introduce this material into a CMOS line. So the only thing you need to change is introduce doping into that material. For example, aluminum doped. Aluminum oxide is also commonly acceptable for CMOS production. So this, this the barrier to introduce this material will be a very low um, threshold. Um, additional advantage for this material is a high cohesive field and a long retention time. So recently we successfully made ferroelectric transistors uh, with doped hafnium oxide on 2D material like molybdenum disulfide and it shows reasonable uh, uh, polarizations and sizable memory windows. This indicates that we potentially can combine this ferroelectric material with 2D material, make extremely compact memory cells. And those memories can be dynamically configurable in between DRAM-like uh, uh, memories and flash-like uh, memories. For DRAM-like memories is you have a very uh, long endurance but very short retentions. The data cannot store very long, but you can read and write many times. For flash-like memories, like flash memory, it has long retentions. You can storage the data for a long time, but it won't have very good endurance. It can only last like 10 to the five cycles, then it will die. 
So you can configure this memory to behave like one of these type memories by controlling how much pulse you put in there to write this memory. So you don't need to decide ahead of time how you're going to design the circuit. You can decide it later by the customer. So that's an advantage for this type of memories. Uh, in addition, it's low power because it's nine volatile memories. So here uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my former colleagues in IBM and my students at UIUC uh, and my collaborators in University of Minnesota, University of Massachusetts, uh, and many other universities uh, and funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention.